So we're going to save questions uh, until the panel at the end. Um, so it's my great pleasure to introduce Steve Brown. Um, he is the director of the Mammalian Genetics Unit at the Medical Research Council and has been instrumental in leading the International Mouse Phenotyping Consortium for a number of years now, and I think it's going to be really exciting to see where that's come to um, today. And also is, has been honored as a fellow for the Royal Society for his foundational work in mouse genetics, and I'm hoping you're going to weave some of those things in as well. So welcome. So uh, thanks very much, Melissa. It's a great pleasure to be here. My goal really today, I think, is to give you some idea of the progress that the International Mouse Phenotyping Consortium is making in terms of moving towards building a comprehensive functional catalog of a mammalian genome, but also as part of that to discuss the impact that the findings of IMPC will have on precision medicine and how it will be an important underpinning to the precision medicine initiative. The IMPC involves around 21 research centers globally, including all of the major mouse genetics facilities around the world, coming together to really uh, answer that key uh, problem that still faces us in uh, human and mouse genomics, and that's our absence of knowledge on the function of the majority of genes uh, in their respective genomes. And in particular, we're remarkably poor at predicting uh, the multiple functions of genes, or pleiotropy, and as David has already alluded to, pleiotropy, and I want to emphasize this throughout the theme of my talk, will be critical to the precision medicine initiative and also critical uh, to using animal models, mouse models, and others in terms of uh, precision medicine. We still only have knockouts for a fraction of the mouse genes, and for those genes, the data is very patchy because it's dependent on the interests and experience of the investigators. Thus, pleiotropy is often not uncovered for those genes. So we need to develop broad-based uh, phenotyping approaches that really does uncover and dissect pleiotropy and will be important in making comparative genomics uh, between uh, mouse and human. Uh, so let me just elaborate a bit on that in this particular slide. Pleiotropy, in fact, is manifest across a whole range of genetic phenomena. Variable expressivity, which one might call stochastic pleiotropy, phenotypic expansion that David has just man mentioned, the cross-species associations that we see from FIWAS studies, and indeed the tremendously extensive and deep pleiotropy that is increasingly being realized in the human genome, so-called network pleiotropy, that has emerged in the new omnigenic view uh, of the human genome landscape that's coming out from GWAS studies. All of that will be required to ensure that we can use disease models in an appropriate way to do the comparisons between disease states in both human and mouse. And we really need to move uh, from uh, a, an era where we have a, a, a small amount of information about real pleiotropy for a small number of genes to a situation where for most genes we understand uh, the multiple functions. So IMPC goals, we are generating a null mutant for every gene in the mouse genome. We're, com we're putting those through comprehensive phenotyping pipelines across all sorts of developmental, physiological and bio biochemical parameters. All of the data is uploaded to uh, a, a, an international data coordination center for quality control, statistical analysis, and so on, that allows us to output a, a, a deep and pleiotropic view of, of gene function. Of course, all of the data is open source, as are the mouse models uh, themselves. The opportunities to use this data across the human genetic spectrum or legion, all the way from rare disease and Mendelian disorder programs that we've already heard about, through into, in uh, the UK, the 100,000 Genomes Projects, pre the Precision Medicine Initiative, Structural var Variant Programs, and, and so on. But importantly, also, this huge raft of multidimensional data that's coming from the mouse needs to synergize with the multidimensional data that's emerging from all of the large-scale human cohort programs uh, that have already been alluded to today. So let me tell you a bit about the program and where we've got to. Uh, the program started by using uh, embryonic stem cell alleles from the International Knockout Mouse Consortium. 
There are about 15,000 of those. And in fact, we're using this allele, uh, this TM1B allele, which is generated from the uh, founder knockout first conditional ready allele. This is a null allele, <coughs> taking out a critical exon and replacing it with a, a laxy reporter. But importantly, all of the mice that we're analyzing are co-isogenic. They're purebred on a black 6N background, obviously reducing unwanted sources of variation. Now, this is a very busy slide, and I'll only spend a brief amount of time on it, but uh, all of the mutant alleles are going through this extensive pipeline, both embryonic and adult uh, phenotyping pipeline that covers many of the uh, disease areas, the systems areas, where we need to uncover that pleiotropic information. Uh, it's important to note that uh, homozygous variable mutations, all of those will go through the adult phenotyping pipeline, but those that are homozygous lethal, which Mary Dickinson will come on to talk about, go through the embryonic phenotyping pipeline. We look at a whole variety of um, uh, uh, phenotyping platforms. We have cohorts of seven males and seven females that will go through uh, the adult phenotyping pipeline. Uh, we also look at fertility and viability, obviously, to identify embryonic lethals, which will then go through the embryonic pipeline. But in addition, of course, we have a LAGZ reporter. We can look at embryonic as well as adult uh, expression as well to gather not only all of the <coughs> physiological and developmental phenotypes, but expression data as well. All of the data from the major mouse production and phenotyping centers around the world comes to the Data Coordination Center at MRC Harwell. It goes through data validation, quality control checks, statistical analysis, before it's moved to the core data archive at EBI uh, in Cambridge. So this is where we are at the moment. From the embryonic stem cell work, we've done nearly 12,000 microinjections. We have nearly 7,000 genotype confirmed lines. This is about a third of the uh, mouse genome. And our most recent data release was for nearly 5,000 lines. We have over 50 million data points and nearly 400,000 uh, images uh, in, in the database. We've also moved on in IMPC now, to, and this will gel with a point that I want to make later, into generating many of the alleles by uh, CRISPR now for faster uh, uh, and cheaper production. Most of the uh, CRISPR alleles that we're making in IMPC involve deletion of a critical region, excising a critical exon, and uh, close to 1,500 new uh, alleles have been generated at IMPC now by this route, of which uh, over 400 uh, have phenotyping data. You can go to the IMPC website to see all of the data that we're producing. It, as I said, it's all open source. You can look for a particular genes and phenotypes and see what uh, phenotypes are associated with particular genes, or screen for particular phenotypes and see which genes gave you those particular uh, phenotypes. Here's just one example of one of my favorite genes, which uh, we looked at quite early on. It's a gene where there's very little known about it, LMOD1. It's expressed in the brain. It's, uh, Robert Williamson looked at it some years ago. He called it part of the ignorome, part of that dark matter around the genome that we know so little about. It only still has six PubMed hits. It's expressed in the brain, but it has a whole slew of pleiotropic uh, uh, phenotypes that were picked up in, in IMPC that for sure bear upon its, its function and will be important in making the comparison with human disease. You can drill down from that data in IMPC to look at all of the specific raw data. Here are beehive plots of the control data set against uh, individual phenotype data for individual phenotype parameters from specific phenotyping platforms. I now want to look at the evolution and impact of IMPC that has come out of that first analysis of about a third of the mouse genome and how it will impact upon precision medicine. Over the last year, we've published a number of different papers that give us some ideas about new insights and new ways of looking and understanding the mammalian genome. And the novel features of the mammalian genome landscape that I'm going to particularly focus on that I think are important for this audience uh, are clearly disease models and the disease models we're finding, novel insights into gene function, and this last point that surely must be critical for precision medicine, and that is sexual dimorphism, the difference in phenotypes for mutations between male and female. 
So if we look at disease model uh, discovery and new function and knowledge, uh, uh, Terry Meehan and Damien Smedley, Damien Smedley's here, led on a, a paper that's just been published in Nature Genetics on the analysis of the first 3,300 genes from IMPC. If we look at the new functional knowledge, 90% of the gene phenotype annotations that we determined had not been reported before. Oh, well over half of the mouse mutants that we created in that release had never been produced before. And there was new functional knowledge for over uh, a, a thousand genes. If we look at models of Mendelian disease from those 3,300 mutants, 889 had known disease associations with the orthologous gene in OMIM orphanet uh, with at least one phenotype. And 360 out of those 889 had phenotypic overlap. And of those, 279 represent the first report of a mouse model for uh, these diseases. So really digging into what is a gap in our knowledge that will be absolutely critical in terms of understanding basic gene function, which will underpin precision medicine. It also <laughs> provided a new slew of information on novel Mendelian disease candidates by looking for mouse genes that mapped into regions for uh, Mendelian disorders for which we don't know the underlying gene, but where there was uh, uh, good matches of the phenotypes. And there were 135 potential candidates there as well. This is just one of the examples of novel models that have been produced. The Barty Beadle Syndrome 5 gene that had never been uh, knocked out in the mouse before, with phenotypes that model the human disease uh, very well, and clearly providing a new disease model for further work in that syndrome. Insights into novel gene function, I'll quickly give you one example there from the hearing loss screen that was undertaken in the IMPC phenotyping pipeline. In fact, at week 14 in the adult pipeline, we do an auditory brainstem uh, measurement, uh, auditory brainstem response measurement, which is a very robust test for deafness. Uh, and uh, uh, we've screened, uh, to, we do two males and two females across a, num a, a number of different uh, frequencies. We've screened over 3,000 lines through IMPC now, all of them analyzed by ABR, and we found 67 mutants that had, were robust for hearing loss. Of these, 15 were uh, known deafness genes, uh, but 52, the vast majority, were novel deafness genes, which had never been associated with deafness in either any model organism or, for that matter, in, in humans. And finally, pervasive sexual dimorphism. We've analyzed all of our data because we've used cohorts of both male and female. We've analyzed all of our phenotype data across all parameters uh, for sexual dimorphism. This was recently published in Nature Comms. And I want you just to look at this panel down here, which is looking at the sex role in genotype effect, and in particular, look at the continuous variables. You'll see that nearly one-sixth of all the parameters we measure show a highly significant sexual dimorphic phenotypic effect. Sexual dimorphism is pervasive, and that's something that we need to bring to the Precision Medicine Initiative as well. So IMPC sits at the center, I think, of mammalian functional genetics by uh, pr providing gold standard mutants, robust reproducible phenotyping platforms, sophisticated QC and analysis tools, and importantly, integrating its efforts with human phenotype data, integrating its efforts uh, with all of these consortia and organizations, integrating its data with many of the other portals and databases, and of course, with the other model organisms as well. It also sits at the interface of a growing area in mouse genetics, which we certainly in the UK are extremely keen to prosecute, and I believe should be developing in all of the countries that have major uh, mouse genetics uh, and mouse functional genomics programs. And that's using the IMPC as a strong basis. Obviously, it provides underpinning information <coughs> on gene function and pleiotropy. But as David Valley has already alluded to, we need to build on top of that significant programs that are validating specific candidate pathogenic variants. And we have such a program ongoing now in the UK. It's called the Genome Editing Mice for Medicine program, led by Sarah Wells. And in fact, Damien Smedley will tell you much more about this in detail tomorrow its outputs, its uh, initial goals, and its successes so far. This interfaces IMPC uh, with uh, organizations in UK like Genomics England, Biobank, the Big Data Institute. 
providing that important interface of going from basic uh, functional information in the mouse to the specific analysis of allele variants. This was also alluded to by David, but we haven't forgotten about it in IMPC. We're now introducing in IMPC a late adult phenotyping pipeline for age-related disease, recognizing that if we are to fully uncover pleiotropy, we have to look not only at early adult stages, uh, but also late adult as well. And a new pipeline, uh, whoops, a new, go back, a new pipeline has been developed uh, that extends extends the uh, early adult pipeline up to about a year or more. In this intervening period, there are opportunities for additional tests. Uh, the adult pipeline is then repeated, and then terminal tests are carried out. This is beginning to give us insight into age-related disease and obviously extending the pleiotropy that uh, we can find uh, for, for all genes across the genome. This is just a more detailed uh, picture of the IMPC leg <coughs> adult phenotyping pipeline. You can see here the early adult pipeline repeated again here at one year and in between the opportunity to carry out many additional tests, uh, more sophisticated tests such as home cage monitoring to really increase our view of pleiotropy for each gene. So in conclusion, IMPC has delivered uh, some 7,000 mouse lines to date about a third of the uh, mammalian genome. Phenotype data from nearly 5,000 phenotype lines is now available. This second phase of IMPC, moving from a third of the genome to hopefully about three quarters of the genome within five years time is well underway. And it's bringing with it a new focus on the identification and characterization of late adult phenotypes and late onset disease. And as I've already mentioned, we expect to have completed the phenotyping of nearly a, a third of the uh, coding genome uh, by the beginning of next year. So we're taking a substantive step towards a comprehensive catalogue of mammalian gene function. It's by no means complete, obviously. And as David has already alluded to, it's not just about one allele, the null allele, it's about additional alleles but it provides a platform for us to reveal the comprehensive pleiotropy that is almost certainly associated with every gene in the genome and to, better, and to have a better science of comparative genomics that will follow from that and be underpinned by that information. So it's establishing a better context and data set for a new era of, of cross-species analysis that undoubtedly will be critical in underpinning any future precision medicine initiative. And I think another uh, view is that some of the novel features that are emerging from a large scale and multi-dimensional analysis of a mammalian genome, which is happening in IMPC, is bringing home to us features that are going to be critical to PMI. And I include in that, for example, uh, the the uh, revelations on pervasive sexual dimorphism that are, that are coming out from, from IMPC. So it only remains for me to thank all of the people in IMPC who have contributed to this data. I honestly can't acknowledge them all. There are hundreds of them involved, including, of course, our collaborators in other initiatives, uh, such as Melissa in the, the, the Monarch Initiative. Uh, and to thank you for your attention. Thank you.